All right, aviators, hello and welcome to YouTube Live. Uh, thank you for joining me. I see that there are one, two, three. Someone was third, so I know there's at least three people here. Uh, my name is Jason Miller. If you don't know the channel, I'm an FAA flight instructor. I've been teaching flying for more than 20 years, and uh, when I'm not flying, I enjoy talking about flying and podcasts and YouTube and whatnot. Uh, and today we're talking about my very favorite topic. Now, some of you guys know that I was like during the pandemic, I was going live on Instagram, I think like every day, uh, which wasn't totally sustainable, <laughs> but it was awesome. And I want to kind of bring some of that back. So what these sessions are, we're going to do these once a month. They're going to be at this time on Wednesdays. So where are we? 1630 Pacific. 1930 on the East Coast or wherever you are in the world. Um, this was the time you guys voted on when I asked you on Instagram. So we're going to do this once a month. And um, you can go to learnthefinerpoints.com slash live to see the full calendar. Uh, but today we are talking about my favorite topic, which is bracketing safety. Yeah, Jason was three minutes late. You know what the funny thing about that is? We were thinking about, okay, we got to promote these things. We got to figure out what we're doing here. We got to get the whole, you know, get it all together. What technology we're we using. We finally just decided, you know what, let's dive in. So this is, uh, we didn't really announce this. This is sort of the announcement and the first night. Um, all right, cool. So um, before I go, see if you guys have any questions. All right, I don't, I don't see it. So this is a lecture. Um, I give a lecture. I give all sorts of lectures all over Oshkosh. Um, I used to go around for the Air Safety Institute before the pandemic, but I'm, I'm talking to pilots live a lot. Uh, and I think there's a lot of concepts in what we're going to talk about tonight and over the next few months that can be unpacked more like an hour is not enough. If anyone has ever been to my lecture, the top 10 things all pilots should know, then, you know, I only ever get to five, right? I only ever make it up to five and then we're out of time. So we're going to kind of stretch out here a little bit. And tonight we're talking about the secret to safety and a couple questions for you guys. And this is kind of a rhetorical question, but um, who's the best at flying, right? Like who, who does this thing that we love to do the best? And what does that mean even to be the best? And <clears throat> um, thank you, William, Bill. Um, but, you know, there are specialty pilots who blow my mind, air show performers, there's air racers, there's military pilots, there's everybody. But I think in, in our world of general aviation, for the, for the reason that most of us are doing it, a success, a win, being the best at what we do means we come home safely every time, right? We go out with, on our own, we come home safely. We go out with our family, we come home safely. Um, and so I think it's wise for us to focus on the people who do that thing the best. Who is the safest? Uh, and, and, and why are they that way? And I also think it's worth taking a moment to reflect on general aviation, you know, all of us as a group, not just me, not just you, but the whole industry. And, and reflect on how we're doing there. Like, how safe are we? And I, I like to run pilots through this little mental game of just imagine somebody that you love. Uh, for me, it's like my wife and my kids. I imagine them. But imagine somebody you love. And that person calls you from across the country. From If you're in California, they call you from Florida. If you're in Florida, they call you from California. And they say, hey, I'd love to come see you. I'm going to get a ticket on American Airlines tonight. I get in at 11 o'clock. Can you pick me up? Right? Nobody feels concerned or most folks don't feel concerned for that person or those people's safety, right? We were pretty sure they're going to get here on time and safely. But now imagine that person that you love calls you and says, I met this really nice person. He owns a 182. He offered to fly me out. Um, I think we're going to be there tomorrow. <laughs> All of a sudden, you know, you're kind of like, wait a minute, who is this person and what are they flying and where did they train and can I see their logbook and where's the checkout flight, right? We don't trust it because we know as a group, we know that there are holes in what we do. So for the next 25 minutes or so, I want to talk to you guys about the secret, how the best, who, you know, the people that are the best at this, the professionals, how they do it and what we can do to emulate that because we want to win. We want to be the one percenter. We want to come home every time, right? Um, so it's a three-step process and it's not rocket science. And if you look back over the last 30 years, it's really intentional. Let's call it the last, yeah, the last 30 years about the commercial operators set up a task force and they actually went to work on figuring out how to improve their safety. And believe it or not, over those 30 years, they reduced their fatal accident rate by over 80%. So they were highly successful in what they're doing. And what we're going to do is emulate 
the procedures that they use and borrow them and distill them down into our world of general, general aviation so that we can be that successful. Um, the process is simple. It's three steps and here it is. Ready? We're going to expand on this, but here it is. You review the accidents. That is, you stay aware of what's going on out there. Who's failing? You figure out procedures that would prevent the possibility of you ever making those very same mistakes and you make those procedures redundant. And then you force compliance with those procedures. And it's bulletproof, like over time. Um, you guys are familiar with the concept of, of bracketing a navigation signal, you know, where you kind of, you fly this way for a while till the needle moves and you fly this way, but over time you get it perfect. Well, that's what this is. Over time, you, you eliminate the possibility of making a vast majority of mistakes. They, people are repeating every month. And one of the things you're going to notice in the GA world is once you start reviewing these accidents, once you actually start looking at them, you're going to think to yourself, half of these accidents would have been prevented if this person only read last month's accidents because we just keep repeating things, right? Um, excellent. Welcome, everybody. British Columbia, Palm Springs, all of it. I'm trying to scan here in case you guys have questions. Um, so let's let's look at that. Let's look at how that works for the pros. And, and, and this is truly how the professional pilots do it. Uh, let's look at an airline crew, for example. Before that crew even gets to that cockpit, they're constrained in what they can or can't do. So there's, there's you know, um, guardrails built all around them. One simple example in the regulations, I believe it's a 121 regulation, is you can't continue an instrument approach if you're a professional pilot, commercial operator flying 121. You can't continue the instrument approach past the final approach fix if the weather goes below minimums. You just can't do it. There's no choice. You'll get fired. You lose your job. It's illegal. You can't do it. There's no choice. You go somewhere else. So in that way, the behavior is constrained. Right? There is a procedure that has been put in place or a rule that has been put in place because so many pilots died trying to do that very thing. I'm trying, well, let's just take a look, you know, we get down there and if we see runway lights, we'll go around again, we'll get a little lower, you know. So many people die doing that, that somebody put in a procedure or a rule, uh, make it redundant, that is there's two pilots there, no one can wink and nod, right? There's two pilots to review each other uh, and they force compliance. If you don't do that, you're fired, you lose your pension, your kids don't go to college, whatever it is, there's a, there's a huge stick, right? That they can hit you with. Um, so. Looking at that in the world of general aviation, you know, how can we uh, emulate the same type of thing? Um, let's start with just the idea that you guys are reviewing accidents. You know, so many pilots say to me like, oh, it's kind of morbid. I have this thing I do or I kind of, you know, I, I review accidents, right? And they feel like somehow ashamed of it. And it's like, you know what? That is the, that is the cornerstone to you not repeating that accident. That is the, the cornerstone to safety, right? So you have to do that, have a regular habit of doing that. Oh no, my internet is laggy and it keeps freezing. Oh. All right. Well, am I with you guys now? Do we just roll through that? All right. Um, I'm going to assume that goes away. Let me know if it gets worse or does not get better. So reviewing accidents is important. If you don't have a process where you sit down and you go through the NTSB reports, at the very least, you should be reading the NAL report produced by the Air Safety Institute every spring. I believe it's every spring, every March. Kind of a summary of what's going on out there, who's getting into problems, where are those problems occurring. Make sure that you are tuned into that part of our world. Um, and the second thing is make procedures and make them redundant. So... Let's look at a couple examples. Let's look at an example of something that you know intimately, and that is a checklist, right? That is a tool for redundancy. And you could say to yourself, well, I'm going to implement a procedure whereby every time I climb the airplane, I run a climb checklist. Every time I level off, I run a cruise checklist. And every time I descend, I'm going to run a descent checklist. And that's my procedure because you know, I read an accident report last month where somebody forgot to enrich in the mix, mixture on descent, the engine failed and blah, 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 blah. So I'm going to make sure I do my checklists. That's great. And that's one of the procedures that I would recommend. Um, and, you know, if you were flying with me, we would keep numbers on that. I would tell you literally what percentage of those opportunities you were hitting and we'd try to, you know, work on it. The next part of that second piece, though, making it redundant is a bit of a trick, right? We're, we're single pilots in a single pilot world. I tell pilots that redundancy is like 
you know, like water in the desert. You have to kind of like pack it in and hold on to it and look for opportunities to be redundant. And we can and are going to spend a couple minutes here just talking about redundancy in the single pilot world. How do we achieve redundancy? Um, the airlines that we we're just talking about have two pilots up front. That's two pilots and two brains and four eyes and four ears. Uh, we don't have that. So looking at that little example of the checklist, let's just look at two possible ways we could use a checklist, right? Like one way is you can pick the list up and you can read it. And that's the way I see most people do it. And I see most people do it that way because that's the way the airlines do it. The problem is the airlines have two people. So when one person reads it, the other person hears it, it is therefore redundant. When a single pilot picks it up by him or herself and starts reading it, it loses 100% of the effectiveness that it was designed you know, to, to do there. It, it loses all of its redundancy. It becomes a, a manual for flying, right? Like, and what's worse, you're relying on this little manual and you're looking at it and you pick your head up for a second, you come back down, maybe you skipped a line. Where's the redundancy? How would you know? There's no way to know, right? So instantly in the single pilot world, this, this tool that you've been taught to use, this checklist, um, really isn't accomplishing its goal, right? So what you'll hear experienced pilots tell you or what you would find if you looked at the professional world of single pilot operators, single pilot cargo operators and whatnot, what you would find is they're that camel in the desert. They're going, okay, so to get redundant here, we're going to have to get creative. Maybe we will leave the checklist where it is for a moment and guess first. Maybe we'll run a GUMPS acronym, or maybe we'll run a flow check, just a, a pattern around the cockpit, or maybe a mnemonic device like the five A's or whatever. But the point is we're intentionally guessing and then intentionally picking up a list to make sure that our guess was accurate, that our guess didn't miss anything. All of a sudden now the checklist is redundant. So tools for redundancy in the single pilot world include mnemonic devices, flow checks, and acronyms, uh, but also talking out loud, right? Um, that is one where you'll, like if you were to go to a single pilot cargo operator and you were to go through their training program, they would have you making audible callouts throughout the entire, throughout all the critical phases of flight. Takeoff, power set, gauges checked, airspeed alive, you know, rotate, no runway, whatever it is. And they're real specific about it. Like if you're flying for one company I can think of in particular, their call is no runway. So if you say out of runway, that's wrong. It's no runway, right? And every time you go in every six months for your little 135 check, they constrain you to this language, right? They're trying to, to modify your behavior, right? To give you this ritual around the critical areas of operation, a ritual that includes redundancy. Um, and that's super important in a single pilot world and it is hard to come by. So if you aren't already doing it, make sure that you're talking out loud as much as possible in the single pilot world. And if you have to, like if it's embarrassing or there's other people on board and you don't want to hear them to hear what you're saying or whatever, just hit the isolation button and continue to talk to yourself. Make that part of your ritual. Um, and I can't go through you know everything I have here, but I did want to show you guys one thing. If you haven't seen, hey, Jacob, can you pull up the uh, iPad? If you guys haven't seen our, our um, ground school app, I want you to know, even if you're an experienced pilot, you can get a free trial here. Go to the flight side and go to the uh, standard operating procedures chapter right here, that second circle. Inside of there is every procedure that I would teach you if you were flying with me and why, right? So flow checks and checklists, takeoff callouts, pre-takeoff briefings, all the procedures that would prevent you from making mistakes. If you're an experienced pilot and you don't think you need the whole app, you're welcome to get the free trial, study this chapter and just cancel before your three days are up. But um, I wanted you guys to know that that's all there. All right. So now the hardest part of this three-step process, the absolute hardest part, a part that I'm not even sure we can talk about this in a minute. If you guys have comments, I'm not even sure this is like really possible under the right pressure. But the, the hardest part is forcing your own compliance with what you've decided ahead of time is the way you want to operate the airplane. All right. And um, this is really hard. Like this is, um, I don't know, I always use this example, but I don't let, I don't own a motorcycle anymore because 
for whatever reason, I would always ride real smart for like the first six or eight months. And then one day I'd be late and I'd have to get across town in 10 minutes and I'd ride like a fool. And I just, I just don't trust myself. Like I know how I'm going to ride at some point. I just rather not mess with it. The airplane fortunately is different. <laughs> I don't have that challenge, but the idea is that forcing your compliance with these procedures ahead of time is extremely difficult. So one thing that you can do, um, and one thing that I'm going to recommend, and this may be where we turn it over to questions or uh, wrap it up, but you want to start a sort of operations manual for yourself. And you want, this is an evolving document. This is what every professional operator has. And this, at the, in the, at the end of the day, that manual is gold because it survives the accident, right? The plane goes down the company survives. The company writes a procedure that prevents that accident from happening again and moves forward in the world. And over time, this operations manual is just the manual for how to stay safe, right? In the operation that they're doing. So we want to try to design something like that for ourselves. Thanks, Brittany. That's really nice. Um, and let's start with the obvious things. Let's just like personal minimums, right? So make sure you have like the things that like, I don't fly when the headwinds are X. I don't fly when the crosswinds are Y and I don't fly when the ceilings are less than X or I don't fly if I haven't gotten eight hours of sleep or whatever your rules are, right? Like there's rules at the top, just we don't go if, uh, but even after that, you can start to describe like, you know, uh, the first thing is a passenger briefing. Anytime someone sits down in the plane with you, um, CFI sits down on the plane with you, give that person a passenger briefing. Not only is it your legal obligation, you know, to tell them, and you really are legally obliged to do that, say, do you know how to operate your seatbelt in the door? I think it's just the seatbelt legally. But if you're not practicing some sort of ritual around that, you're not going to do it when it matters. So start to write those things down. There's a pre the passenger briefing. There's a pre-taxi briefing where I look at my diagram. There's taxi turns where I check my turning instruments. There's cigars in the run-up area. There's a pre-takeoff briefing. There's takeoff callouts. There's checklists all the way up to altitude. And finally, now I can relax. Um, and you'll have some procedure for those critical phases of flight, all of that stuff written down. And I think the best thing we can do in a single pilot, unregulated environment like part 91 is give that manual that we've written to ourselves to a CFI that we respect to us ideally. And I know this isn't easy for everybody, but ideally a CFI, you can have a long-term relationship with. And I would go back to that CFI like airline pilots do once every six months, not so much to practice steep turns and slow flight and all that other stuff. But to make sure that that CFI is holding you, keeping you honest with these procedures, uh, because I really believe at the end of the day, and you guys might see this when you start looking at the accident reports, there's always a chain and it's not, you know, even when you read something simple, like, oh, it's a loss of control. It's a loss of control accident. You can't fly. Let's go work on MCA or slow flight or stalls. It's like, okay, sure. Maybe that's what it was. And maybe that's work you can do. But there's always a chain that leads up to this. And there's many opportunities to break that chain with procedures or rules or constraints ahead of time when you figure this out here in the comfort of your office or wherever you are. Uh, and then get, having some accountability where there's a CFI who knows what that is for you so that if you're ever out there feeling the pressure of, you know, I got to get to this meeting and I know the winds are gusting 38, but... I'm just going to go for it. At least maybe in the back of your mind, you're thinking, well, okay, if the accident report starts like, you know, Windsor Gustin 38 and pilot, you know, loses directional control on takeoff, my CFI is going to know that I'm way outside my operations manual. It's nothing like the stick the airlines have, but it's something, right? And in all these areas, reviewing accidents, making procedures redundant and forcing our own compliance, we have to take what we can get. Like we kind of are that, that camel in the desert. Um, last thing I want to say about this really, and, and then I'll try to stop, but it's, I don't want people to think that these constraints make flying not fun. Or it's like, you know, like, I don't want to fly like that. Like the reason I got into GA is I want to have freedoms and whatnot. I believe that rigidity provides the opportunity for freedom. <laughs> so I just want you to think about that. It's like, I believe that a tight schedule in your day actually creates opportunities for you to relax, right? Like if you haven't scheduled things out and you don't know, then you're just stressed all day. Long. Oh, that thing. Oh, shoot that thing. And oh man, I forgot to call so-and-so. And like you're on your heels all day long, but if you have it all dialed out and then a couple hours in the afternoon to just go play tennis, then you get to go play tennis and you're stress-free, right? And it's kind of like that with SOPs. 
Um, I use music as an analogy. I think it's, I'm a musician and I think it's interesting that improvisational music has a very rigid structure. It has to, because you're making it up. You have to know where the, where the structure goes. So try what I'm recommending with the SOPs, with the operations manual and all that. And if you're somebody who's thinking, man, that's like, that's not the way I want to fly. Just keep in mind what I said and try it for yourself. Because I really believe that that rigidity, once you've got it as part of your fundamental habit pattern will help you be confident that you haven't missed anything, which will allow your stress to go away and know when it's appropriate to exercise your freedom in the airplane, which is most of the flight, just not those critical phases. All right. Let's see if we have any questions. Um, boy, I think I missed a lot. So um, Jacob, if there's anything you noticed that you thought was good, let me know. Also, you guys, um, we're going to do this once a month for about a half hour, uh, this time, this day. So if you want to see the schedule, it's at learn the, oh, there it is. Jacob can just put it up there. Um, we're talking about the Titanic next month. And then we've got, uh, opposing bases joining us in November. And, uh, in December, we've got the top five things all pilots should know, because I'm going to give you guys those last five finally. <laughs> and, um, there's also a possible aviation summit in December, but we'll let you know. Um, let's see. Regular. Uh, yeah. Ty, you, you can email me. It's, 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 it's a, it's a bit tricky, but it's like, you know, you never know. It just depends on where my students are in their training actually. Um, as my CFI, as a CFI, my students know my personal minimums. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good one. So as a CFI, my students know my personal minimums too. And if you are a CFI listening, you have to, like Larry said, there, one hundred percent have to adhere to your to your personal minimums and your SOPs. Um, certainly, while you're with your student, and I'm not saying that you should. Um, I'm not saying you should fake it, like you shouldn't do it when you're not with your student. I'm saying you should always do it, but with the understanding that no person is one hundred percent perfect, nobody, and that some you're going to cut corners and maybe reflect back on it and say, oh, "I shouldn't have done that," and hopefully you'll correct toward perfect. But like Larry's saying, in front of the students, it's devastating because it's not just about you, it's about them. And if you demonstrate that to them, that you have SOPs and procedures, but you don't use them, um, that's really what you're teaching. That's all you're teaching. So anyway, um, let's see if there's any good ones here. Hmm. That's an interesting thought, John. Um, we can bring that one up from John Wingate. He just says he thinks the concept of best glide under stress has led to the majority of stall spin accidents. It's an interesting thing to think about. I mean, what John's bringing up here is that if you're trained to sort of go to best glide, which is a pretty skinny speed, right? In most planes, like if you're in a Cessna 172, best glide at max gross is 68. Some of the older models, 65. And if you don't have flaps, your stall speed's 42. So it's, I think what John's saying is you can get distracted under stress, be looking for runways and airports and whatever else, and there's not enough margin there. Um, that's an interesting point, John, because if, you know, if best glide is not necessary, like if the airport is easily glidable, right? Maybe there should be sort of two speeds to think about. Um, but anyway, I do think that training that is part of like the under stress part like there's a lot of work we can do there. You know, this is more than we have time for, but it's like flight training, not flight education. And there's a lot of work we can do to sort of put pilots under stress in the training environment safely to help them build calluses to that and react in a, in a, um, automatic way, right. Where they're not really thinking they're just going through the motions. I think that's possible. Um, and again, we don't have time for this, but my flight instructor, Richard used to literally like hurt me. I called it like training by trauma, you know, hit me with a stick or poke me in the ribs or whatever uh, old school guy. And I, and you know, I hated it and I, I promise I'd never be that way, but I'm still searching for something as effective, to be honest with you. Like, I think that training by trauma thing is quite effective. So if you have a student who's willing to be stressed out, you know, you can prep them ahead of time and say, okay, today we're going to try to bring up your stress level. Let me know if it gets to be too much, but you know with your permission, here's what I'd like to do. All right, you guys, we're pretty much out of time. I want to thank you all for being here. Please come to learnthefinerpoints.com slash live and join us next month. I think we're going to be streaming there at the website too. There's the schedule. Um, also get your free three-day trial of the Ground School app and you can go through all the procedures that I would teach you if you were flying with me, uh, only you don't have to fly all the way out here. So 
anyway um thank you guys so much and i'll see you next month